All right, time to start. Welcome to the fourth lecture. You all had your domain modeling workshops. Did they work, work out well? Practically, they worked? Yeah? Good. Any questions on the workshops? You may ask specific questions. How many of you included a member conceptual class in your domain model? Anyone? Sort of. Sort of? User, we have uh, someone, but why, why name it user? If you go to domain expert, they should recognize themselves. Would they recognize user or would they recognize member? The boat club does not have users, they have members. Use the vocabulary of the natives. If you ask the secretary, for example, take a look at this user. He or she would not know what the user is because they don't have users, they have members. I think person is a little bit better, but member is what they have, so you should probably use that. Member to role? role? You mean the authentication part? Yeah? Think about that part for a little bit. Authentication, what is that? Logging in and logging out and stuff. Do the both club do that? Probably not. Should that be included in a domain model for a both club then? Yeah, you could think of yourself as a user of the end product, of course, but uh, a user seems to me more like a design and software concept, thinking about a solution more than of a problem. And we had this matter of roles also and authentication. That is also more or less a necessary evil for us to make a web-based system for the boat club. So it's a solution for a problem, more than part of the problem domain of both clubs. If you ask the secretary or the uh, people responsible in the boat club, they would not have an, a clue about roles and authentication and stuff like that. They know about boats and harbors and members and stuff. I think it's probably not a good idea to mix authentication domain with boat club domain. You could also think about it in a reuse scenario. You probably would like to reuse the authentication when you do some kind of other system. And that would be complicated if the boat club is mixed in into that. So think about what is actually in the domain and what is outside of the domain. And if you want to do for the authentication part, that would probably be best to put in a separate domain model. I have seen uh, students try to mix those two domains and it becomes much more complicated than it needs to be. I will take, we will take a look a little bit about the administration part later on. How many of you included a secretary in your uh, domain model? Why? Because of? Secretary 
Yeah. Also a special privilege stuff. So it's because of the authentication? Mostly. No? Is there any relationship from any other classes in your domain to the secretary? Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. That is, that is a, a common way of thinking. But you also need to think about the separation of uh, thinking about information and, and static structures in the domain model and thinking about uh, more of the dynamic view from the requirements. And stating that who does what, what in the system is not a good thing to include in the domain model. That is much better to have in the requirements as they are. It's clearly stated what the secretary can do in the system. Including it in the domain model points to the fact that you need to remember that association. For example, we need to know uh, what secretary uh, added a, uh, an event in the calendar, for example. Is that something that we need to know? Exactly what secretary did that? Then it could be a part of the domain model. If it's not necessary to know what secretary added that event, you don't need to include it just to show that the secretary is the role that does this. That is much better to, to state in a use case diagram, for example. So be clear about what to include in the domain model that you do. And think about the separation of a dynamic view, rules, rights and privileges that are much better to express in the requirements model. And the static information structures are be better to express in the domain model. Yeah, the, we, we talked a little bit about uh, if you should include a secretary or uh, not in the domain model. And I, I, of course, wouldn't say it's absolutely dead wrong to do it. But I don't think there is anything in the requirements that says that we need to know what secretary had added a calendar event, for example. So you add a little bit of complexity. I get a question here, how about association roles? Uh, I'm not really sure what you mean. Could you give an example? I, I don't think uh, we have, for example, a member in the role as a secretary that adds things to a calendar. I, I don't think you need to overcomplicate things in, in your domain models uh, and, and for the first part include these roles and stuff, authentication, it's a pretty well-known domain. Uh, it's not really that complicated. Uh, so I think you should focus on the boat club and the domain classes that you can find there. I don't, also don't think you need to add a lot of redundancy by saying, oh, the secretary can do this, the secretary can do that in the domain model. That is much easier to express in the requirements and, for example, in a use case diagram if you need to do that. However, if there are requirements that state, oh, we need to know what boat a member owns because of all these other functions that we have, then there, of course, should be some kind of 
link between a member and his votes. Yes, Santa, that should be okay to do that. So take a look at your domain models again. Go through the rules of domain modeling and think really hard about what you have added and, and see is it just redundancy or is it a good thing to add it? Yes? Yeah, I, I think we have this role, role, uh, role stuff again. Sure, you, you could add it, but I think it, it complicates the domain model more than it adds something to it. Yeah. No associations. I think for re reuse reasons, the authentication and role parts are, are better left, left out of the domain model of both clubs because the authentication and the roles, it's, it's more of a necessary evil to, to get an IT system running. If we did the whole system with pen and papers, you would not need any authentication because the secretary would be the only one with the key to the, to the room or something like that. But it's a common mistake, I see it every year. Students throw themselves at the authentication part because I think it's also something that you recognize. Oh, I know about logging in and I know about rules and I know, know that stuff because it's software. It's software thinking. Oh, the, the actual boat club, that's not so important and fun, but this part I know so I can, can uh, dive into it. Yeah, the question was uh, about adding a, a, a role conceptual class and uh, use that in the member class uh, for, for some way. So one question more from uh, the chat here. So you, just to be clear, you only need to specify the member and what this member can do not the other roles specified in the use cases. If there is nothing that indicates that you need to remember the link between a secretary and uh, something else, it is not uh, necessary to include it in the domain model. But you could of course make the assumption that, oh, we will have 50 secretaries and we need to know which secretary actually added this calendar event. That is something that you can add to your requirements, of course. And you can go to your domain expert and ask them, okay, we found this. Should, is, it, is it a good thing that every secretary can, for, for example, erase any calendar event? That would be the consequence of not having a link between who actually added the calendar event and the secretary. Is it hard? Confusing. Uh, I, I think the uh, one of the confusing parts about domain modeling is that you need to let go of the software thinking and you need to find the domain that you are modeling and really, really think about, okay, is this part of the domain or is it actually something else? So, okay, we have some administrative stuff going on here also. Uh, if you look at the, I've added a page on the uh, course homepage, workshop deadlines. And here you also have a form for handing in your work. In this form, you have a group contact person and you have the additional group members also. So it's only one person per group that needs to do the actual handing in. Uh, and you will add some information, for example, the URL where I can find your stuff. 
and you, you include the language that you used in your model, and you include the language you would prefer to get uh, on your peer review. And as soon as I start getting some submissions, I will start handing out groups for peer review. And you will get two groups to peer review. And you will get some instruction on, on how to perform the peer review also. Questions about the handing in part? Yeah? Yeah. With comments yeah. Okay. Yeah. So not each one. No, not each one. One member, one hand in per group, so to speak. And those of you who are members of the group, you, you can just list yourselves here also, so, so that we know who has handed in uh, something and has been part of the group. If we made individual diagrams in the group, should we hand them in separately? Um, I think. You could either see yourselves as single person groups, or you could um, make one final pass and uh, make one uh, final diagram in your group and hand that in as a group then, in that case. Any more questions on the submission and handing in stuff? It should not be that complicated. So, uh, and the deadline is the 23rd. So after that, you're pretty much screwed if you have not handed in anything. Uh, and you will, of course, also miss the peer review because you won't be included in the peer review. Uh, and the peer reviews should be handed in by the 29th. And I will post a similar form for doing that. So the first 23rd, yeah. But if you're early, earlier and, and finished already or something like that, fill in the form because I, as soon as I get some, some students uh, that have submitted, I will start handing out your peer reviews. So you will get more time. If you wait t until the deadline, you have uh, six days to perform the peer review. If you, hand, if you get a bunch of students at hand in this week, we probably get a few more days. So it's good to submit early, but at the same time, don't uh, submit just to submit. Make, make a good work also. I have a question here in the chat. I also have one final thing, one final complaint actually. It's for the students in Växjö that did not present anything on the workshop. Remember that this is your best opportunity to get feedback on your models and on your work and improve them. That is it is crucial that you present something. Now, for uh, grade four and five, we have a final deadline. So after you do the hand-in and you get the peer reviews, you're free to improve your models for grade three until the final deadline. It would be quite useless to do peer reviews and not be able to improve on your models after that, the feedback that you get. So for grade three fixes and stuff, improvements, and for grade four and grade five for each workshop, you have until the 7th of November. And there will be a similar form for doing the final hand in here. So the peer reviews are also a crucial step in becoming 
better at modeling, better at understanding other people's models, and giving feedback on other people's models. Any more questions on, on this? No? Let's go back to the front page then. One, more, one final uh, thing is the confirmation of course participation. We are in week three of the course now. And uh, people who register for the course but does not actively participate will be removed from the course because we get really lousy statistics otherwise and get a lot of bashing from upper management if we don't do this. So if you intend to participate in the course, fill in the form. And the form will be closed tomorrow at 1500 hours. And here you just say, I confirm my participation in the course. Uh, and you fill in your first name, your last name, and your username. And that should be uh, it. And after that, I will go through the list of registered students and I will remove anyone who has not filled in the form. All right, feel free to ask questions also in the forum about the, the workshops or the domain modeling part. It is perfectly fine to ask specific questions and also to your tutors. It is not probably not a good idea to send them an entire model and say, is this okay? Uh, so if you have specific questions, ask them in the forums or send them to your tutors or to me maybe. I would prefer if they go in the, in the forum because then other people can add their point of view and we can have a discussion about things. All right, moving on then. We are actually now leaving the domain modeling part of the course. It is done and finished. And we will now enter the exciting world of software. And we will start with software architecture. Anyone heard about that before? No one? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think I, I I often like to approach this this subject from from a, from a problematic st st standpoint. You, you have we have problems in software often. For example, uh, many of you have done smallish projects and often in these projects you kind of like come to a point in the project where the software you build is kind it becomes a little bit too large and when you add stuff to it it kind of like deteriorates probably a bit more than you add to the software so for every new feature or for every new bug you fix you kind of like get three or four or five new problems.
So as systems grow, they become large, and we often run into a point where they cannot evolve smoothly, even, even if it has a good low-level implementation or design. Uh, maybe some of you can recognize yourselves in this from, pro from projects you have done. The concepts of large is, of course, quite subjective. Uh, but this is something that I, I feel that I, I run into myself, that, OK, I, I, I come to a certain point of complexity. And even though if I, I, I'm pretty good at writing if statements and, and for loops and stuff like that, the low level stuff is, is not a problem. I often run into problems uh, of this, this kind. You could, could maybe think about it as having really good carpenters, really good plumbers, really good electricity guys, and really good uh, f furniture people and interior designers and stuff like that. When they're, if they are trying to build a house, you can have all these great things and they can work properly, but the house itself is maybe not that good anyway have a really beautiful kitchen and a really five really beautiful toilets and and the low level stuff really works but the overall experience of the house is not as good You also tend to take a lot of early decisions in your projects. For example, you decide on an implementation language and you decide a lot of technical stuff quite early on. And this is maybe something that has been provided to you. Oh, you should make an application. It should be a database application. You should use this language. Uh, or you have been more free and, and then maybe you have selected an uh, technology or implementation language more out of con convenience. I know this. Uh, I want to use it more. I want to learn more about it. Or you have maybe selected a language or technology that you would like to learn. And maybe not thought about the technology, technology's impact on the actual product. Will this this, is this decision good for the product or not? An extreme case could be uh, making a you make a console application. You make the decision, oh, I will do this in, in the Java console or as a uh, C sharp console application. And that decision has impacts on, the, uh, on other requirements in, in the system. For example, it can be very hard to make a user-friendly system if you decide on the console. Maybe your users are used to graphical user interfaces and point and click stuff and drag and drop and concepts like that. It's probably not a good decision then to, to focus on a console application. Maybe they are system administrators and they really want a fast scriptable application. Then maybe a console application is the best choice.
maybe you decide really early on that, oh, this will be a web-based system. So what about security? That could be quite problematic in, in web-based systems. You first of all have a lot of programming mistakes that can have a great impact on security and vulnerability of the system. You often have a lot of server softwares that you need to configure, database servers and web servers and uh, stuff like that keep APIs and stuff updated all the time to include the latest patches and security stuff. So going for a web-based system when you have very high security requirements is maybe not a really, really good idea. And you need to think about these things really early on. Why do we need a web-based system. What is the impact of selecting that type of system? And these are questions that software architecture are meant to shed a light on. You should make informed decisions and you should make decisions that you know will provide both good and bad stuff for you. Building a web-based system has many advantages. We have a familiar user interface paradigm with a web browser. We have a multi-user architecture. We can have many users at the same time. On the other hand, we may have security problems, or at least problems implementing this in a really, really secure way. So you often have these conflicting requirements that you need to think about. And the goal of software architecture is to shed a light on these questions, shed a light on these qualities, and make you select architectures that are good for you, your system and your project. So uh, having a documented, implemented, tested, and deployed software architecture is the goal of the elaboration phase in the unified process. And this is also the point that the unified process is architecture centric. This is something you should focus on early in your projects. Because it can be a pain in the butt to add user friendliness afterwards. It can be a pain in the butt to add security afterwards. It can be a pain in the butt to add performance afterwards. So we have focus on capturing the system qualities and making sure that they can actually be met by focusing on software architecture early on. Right, questions? I don't know if you are that much wiser, but we will continue and we will actually find our way through this and look on how do we actually 
realize the software architecture in our code. That is, how does the high-level decisions that we make, the design decisions that we make on this high level, how are they reflected in the actual implementation? And that will be the focus of especially the uh, lecture tomorrow. So there will, there will be coding soon. Don't worry. Yeah, uh, 15 minutes break.